see the launch. What it is, is it is a hard X-ray imaging telescope. X-rays are hard to image because they tend to go through things. The only way you can do it is have grazing incidence optics where an X-ray comes in and, and is it designed to just skim the surface of a mirror, a polished mirror, and then it can be sent off to focus. That means very long focal length instruments. Uh, the, the, the finest X-ray optics ever flown are on the, currently are in the Chandra X-ray Observatory. Uh, but they can only focus relatively low energy X-rays. So above 10 kilo electron volts, um, the, uh, the sky has basically never been imaged clearly with, with, with actually focusing on it. So this is the first time this has ever been done. Um, people have observed X-rays in those regions, but with very coarse, essentially big X-ray garbage cans aimed in different directions and kind of collect, collect X-rays, and they have a very blurred and fuzzy view of where these come from. Now, the kinds of celestial objects that produce X-rays in this energy range are things like uh, uh, stellar mass black holes accreting from companions, hard X-ray sources like that. Uh, remnants of supernova explosions can have hard X-rays from, uh, from cosmic ray electrons. Um, and uh, uh, some pulsars can produce X-rays in that range. And maybe other things we don't even know about because they're too obscured to be seen by uh, lower energy instruments like Chandra. So this should open a whole new uh, uh, world of the heart, the imaging heart X-rays. By the way, the technology is quite interesting. To, to um, the, the mirrors are made of multi-layers. They're successive thin layers of different, uh, increasingly dense materials. So that X-rays of different energy, the hardest, the highest energy X-rays penetrate through most of those and bounce off the deepest layer. Slightly less energetic X-rays bounce off of a layer that's a different material that's further out. Uh, so with this technology, it's possible to, uh, uh, to, to make these images. Now, what's going to happen in a few minutes, this uh, uh, telescope is in a satellite, in a, in a Pegasus rocket, which is being carried under the belly of uh, a, an old Lockheed L-1011 TriStar uh, run by Orbital Sciences Corporation. That airplane is currently approaching the, the drop region in the South Pacific uh, near Kwajalein Atoll. Uh, and what you're going to see is actually kind of underwhelming. The, uh, there's a camera on the underside of the airplane watching the rocket. The rocket will be released in whatever it says at 556. So that's just, the, that's the, okay, you have the green dot is the current location of the airplane. Uh, it has to be pointed in just the right direction. Uh, the, uh, the drop is what will occur in five minutes. You'll just see it disappear. Five seconds of free fall, in which time all you physics majors can calculate it will drop about 120 meters. Um, uh, the rocket first stage will ignite. I don't think we're even going to see that. Uh, so what, what NASA TV is going to do is cut away to uh, the control room, I believe, and we will be hearing people telling us what the status is of the various checkouts. One minute in, the first stage is complete. Um, about three minutes in, the second stage is complete, and the fairing, the, uh, the nose cone, essentially blows off uh, with pyro, which are seriously called pyrotechnic devices that explode the, uh, the nose cone off, and the satellite will be exposed. Uh, about 13 minutes in, I don't know if we'll follow it that long, will be when the third uh, stage is dropped, the solar panels uh, come out, and the thing begins behaving like a satellite. Now, the the, the nature of X-ray optics are such that the instrument has a very, very long focal length. So the only way they can get the, um, pack the thing into a nose cone when it needs to be 30, me 30 feet long, 10 meters long, uh, the, the mirrors have to be that far from the detector because the amount of focusing is so slight. Uh, the only way you can pack that into the nose cone is by compressing the mirror assembly on a long, extensible boom. So the real, uh, gut-wrenching part of this mission is going to be in about a week, when after all of the initial orbital checkout is done, this mass is going to deploy and it is going to slowly extend perfectly, to what we uh, firmly hope, um, to a length of about 33 feet, uh, at which point actual observations can begin. Uh, then there will be several weeks of checkout. Science ob observations, the kinds of things that I'm more closely involved with, will begin in about a month. But uh, this is a really exciting time for, for those of us working in this field. Um, you write a proposal and you say, we'll study these kinds of objects that we know about. But one of the amazing things, whenever you open a new window on the universe, uh, 
uh, you'll find things that you didn't expect. And you can hardly say, we will discover lots of things that we don't know what they are yet. But in fact, that's what we expect to happen. One of the major projects is going to be a survey of large parts of the galaxy, uh, perhaps a survey of, of the large Magellanic cloud, and we just don't know what we'll find. So uh, the, the, the science results will start dribbling out in a couple of months, but in uh, here, we are getting very close to, uh, to launch it. So uh, uh, perhaps it would be worth turning up the sound. Uh, let's see what the, anybody know what the altitude of the aircraft is? It's about 40,000 feet. This saves a lot of energy. It doesn't seem like much compared to low Earth orbit, but getting up 39 or 40,000 feet actually allows the uh, considerably smaller rocket to go. It's cheaper. Copy, check 